I have an awesome guest with me today. I have Mike Clay from ESPN Fantasy. Um, thank you so much for your time, Mike. Um, you know, we're, we're getting closer to the fantasy season. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was, uh, what is your favorite aspect of the NFL preseason? Oh, the preseason, man. It's just uh, definitely seeing the rookies, right? I mean, it's our first time to see these guys in a pro uniform. And some of the, I mean, some of these guys were superstars at the collegiate level. And, you know, some guys were kind of unheralded at that level. And, you know, some will work out, some won't. You know, we'll see guys that, that struggle who are just dominating on Saturday. Uh, and then guys who are almost unheard of will kind of come out of nowhere and immediately join the, you know, the the star radar or, you know, certainly the fantasy radar. So it's nice to watch those guys kind of develop, especially the guys we like as sleepers, to see them kind of progress and see if they're going to make some noise. And and uh, some will work out. You know, I think about someone like Chris Carson, who just retired, who I loved, and he made noise right away and panned out. And then other guys like Bryce Butler, who I loved and didn't didn't quite work out. Hung on, like on the end of a bench for a long time, but didn't uh, never turn into a, a reliable starter in the pros. But, uh, you know, uh, nonetheless, uh, I'm really excited to see these first year players. Yeah, yeah. I actually, uh, through your retweet, I saw you were wearing the Chris Carson jersey the other day, uh, the day after he retired. I love Chris Carson, too. He's one of my favorite players. I, I You know, I mean, I'm sure you agree. It's just the the heart, the, the tenacity of a guy like that to go out there and just compete with the very, very best. Um, you know, kind of an unheralded sort of guy. <clears throat> love that. It's, it's tough to see him go, but um, shout out to Chris Carson. Just show some love there. Um, yeah, and I agree. I think when the player I'm going to be watching the most, I'm really interested to see what James Cook um, kind of does and what kind of role they want to try him out in, in the preseason. So that's one player I'm definitely going to be looking at. Um, next question I had for you, and this is you know, what you're most well known for, in my opinion, um, is your projections. You know, you, you, you have incredibly detailed projections and you put them out there for free. I know I look at them all the time. I link them to a lot of my content so people can reference my comments and opinions against somebody that we kind of know, you know, is the gold standard uh, to look at. Um, can you briefly, I know this is probably a complicated question, but can you briefly walk us through the uh, the process you go through of, you know, projecting a, a single NFL team? Like, how does that start? You sit down on your computer and then well, what happens? How's the magic happen? Yeah, I mean, truthfully, I built this tool about uh, a decade or so ago and um, from scratch. And then, uh, you know, I just constantly upgrade it. Right. So I guess that to answer your question, you know, well, in a way, it's always evolving. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. the same depth chart, uh, you know, is, is there a year of the year. It's just constantly being updated and, and there's adjustments. But basically, you know, after the, the season ends. I'll go into kind of tear down mode for about a month. You know, I have projections of probably 11 months a year, uh, but I kind of go into tear down, kind of rip things up, put the IR players back on the roster, remove the free agents, and then kind of dig into league trends, coaching changes, player trends, team trends, all that kind of stuff. Basically update the league based on what we learned in the, in the previous season. Um, and then it's just going, going in, you know, into the uh, the nerd lab, I guess, you know, and kind of putting my head down and studying every every team, every player, and uh, you know, seeing kind of what expectations should be in year two. You know, is the guy going to progress in his second year, and or, or the next year, I should say. You know, is, is it a rookie who's going to progress the next season? Is it an older player who we might expect to drop off? Uh, you know, did this guy change teams? How does that impact him? So uh, again, there's there's a lot of you know reg regressing the rate stats and uh you know kind of doing the subjective part which is you know determining the sh the carry share the pr the target share that kind of thing mm -hmm. so uh it's a it's a lot of layers again this is kind of it in a nutshell there's a lot to it on a variety of levels and it's an always yeah. evolving process that again i'm updating basically year round for the last you know 12 yeah. 15 years whatever it is now yeah, I love that. And like I said, I, I look at your projections multiple times a month. And I always one thing I love about it is one of the very first things I see is you put your little date for the last time you update. I have it open right here on my laptop. You updated it 48 hours ago. So I know this is, you know, as good as it gets, really, when it comes to projections. So we I know I can say thank you very much for these. You, and I'm sure a lot of other people, whether they say it or not, they use these as like a backbone or as a reference point of a lot of things, you know, um, and it, it's an invaluable resource. And just as an IDP person, you know, the fact that you don't look away from that, skimp away from that, um, that is also extremely valuable to us here at the IDP Army and to other, you know, IDP fantasy players. So we appreciate that a lot. Um, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, okay, another question. This is a little more fun question. What excites you right now the most kind of about the current fantasy football 
the industry and the culture and kind of the, the 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 trajectory that we're kind of on. You know, I know the industry's been getting some shakeups. Your man Matthew Barry, the Godfather, he just uh, took took off solo. It looks like doing his fantasy uh, fantasy life thing. Um, and it looks like, are you running the whole show at ESPN now? What What are your thoughts on the <laughs> overall just the overall market, industry, culture? What What are you What are you excited about right now in fantasy? Yeah, yeah, I, w- I wouldn't say I'm running things. You know, we have a great team here at uh, in the fantasy football department, right? So myself, Field Yates, Stefania Bell, Daniel Dopp will be uh, rotating on the podcast this season, and then uh, of course we'll we'll be keeping fantasy football now rolling on Sunday morning. So you know, we love Matthew. Obviously, it was tough to see a friend leave, but uh, you know we have a great team uh, in place here uh, in our in our department. So I'm really excited for the future. So really excited for that. You know, it's a little bit it's a, a new era, you know, mm-hmm. for sure. But uh, I'm really excited for that. And as for the industry as a whole, I mean, just growth. You know, since I got in the industry, it's grown so much, and there's so many uh, talented people joining, like yourself, who uh, you know are just doing a doing really good work you know, digging deep and, and finding new ways to look at the game and make it everyone better uh, at the game. And it's just a really positive community. I mean, if you're on, if you're on like fantasy football, Twitter, it might not always seem that way. Um, but you just, you know, you just need to know where to look, you know, there's, there's so mm-hmm. there's toxic, pe- toxic people in every industry. Don't worry much about that. I mean, especially as you meet people within the industry, like uh, you and I will be hanging out here soon out in Canton at the hall of fame for an event. There's going to be a lot of great people out there. And we always have a great time. There's not, people aren't fighting and in people's faces and you know, it's, it's not like that. It's just a really good, good, healthy environment. And everybody uh, for the most part gets along. So uh, that's, that's the thing I think I love the most is just the the positivity and uh, the relationships that I've, I've found myself in over the years. <clears throat> yeah, I, I will, I will echo that. I agree. The, the fantasy football industry in many ways mirrors, you know, your leagues, you know, you go in and, you know, you got a little rivalry with so-and-so, you got a little, you know, side conversation with what's his face, you know, and you and, you know, you, you, you have these little um, interactions, these interpersonal moments with people in your industry and in your league. And that builds, you know, a cultural relationship, a community, people you feel comfortable being upset with, people you feel comfortable, you know, dunking on you know your friends you, you you say things to people that you love you wouldn't say to other people because you know that you know um you kind of have that that rapport with them and it allows you to be yourself in the best way and i think the industry because it is a, a sport within a sport you know i mean we're playing a competitive game around a competitive game i think it allows us to activate some of the some of the more primal parts of human nature, but also part of things that make us like a community or a tribe. You know, there is always a little bit of head to head. It's good. But again, like only one guy can win your 12 man league. Right. So that's kind of to be expected. But I agree. I think the industry personally, just my comments on there, kind of like you said, with more and more people coming in, I feel like it's bringing everybody more information, more comments, more perspectives. Um, and it's kind of elevating and evolving the game, you know, best ball, super flex. These things weren't common verbiage or semantics, you know, three years ago. Now they're very much entwined into the culture of fantasy football. And that opens up the doors for, you know, new, new, new ways to play, new strategies, new people to bring in new ideas um, and just continue the accelerated growth. So um, definitely mirroring or echoing what you said there. Um, all right, I want to get you out of here because I know you got a lot to go do. I have two more questions for you, all right? Um, and this one's a little bit uh, kind of circling back on that with the the growth in the industry. And I, I have some comments, but I wonder what you have to say. With the industry in the field, you know, becoming more data-driven, analytics-driven, and just generally sharper, you know, with information being out there, the same information being available in 20, 30 different spots, you don't have to necessarily go find it now. How important is it in your opinion, to be to continue to emphasize being relatable and entertaining with an audience or new people to fantasy as a creative and a creator versus taking on a role of a more kind of like in a rigorous sort of academic or an educational role where you're trying to teach people. Um, I um, I have found personally, and this is just me speaking, but I have found that a lot of best ball content is extremely alienating to me. And I love best ball. I've done hundreds of best ball drafts. But when I get in conversations with guys about best ball, it stops. It feels like it's not fantasy football anymore. And I worry that sometimes we are trying to impress or flex on each other or show that we're right too much and we're forgetting our audience. And so I have personally put a little more emphasis on being 
kind of just being a layman or a, kind of a dummy. You know, I'm, I'm fine being the dumbest guy in a room because, because I want to be a, a, a bridge for people. So I've kind of I just wonder what your comments are on that, the, 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 the educating versus the being entertaining and relatable and something people want to come back to versus the kind of the academic nature that some analysts seem to have uh, taken on. Yeah. Um, so this is something that's very important, walking that line, right? And and some of it depends on uh, on your platform, right? I mean, some analysts are running premium sites where you pay hundreds of dollars or a thousand dollars, whatever it is, with the goal of this is a side job. I'm making money here, you know, and that's fine. You know, if that's what you want to do with your time, it's more of a more of a uh, money maker than a than entertainment. That's totally fine. But you're right. I mean, there's all more, you know, 99% of people are just out to have fun, you know, maybe make a couple bucks here in a league with their buddies, but it's mostly for fun. So, you know, that's something that I have evolved in for sure. I mean, when I, I think anyone who's known me for a long time knows that when I got in the industry, it was all uh, just totally creating stats, projections, it, no entertainment pretty much whatsoever, just all uh, here's, here's how to get an edge, right? And back then, mm -hmm. fan, fantasy wasn't as uh, evolved, you know, like it just, th there was some basic stuff you could use to get a huge edge. You know, somebody would have a huge touchdown rate and people would just assume that guy was going to score eight, nine, 10 touchdowns again. And people are just understanding now how hard that is to do and understanding touchdown regression to the mean. I mean, regression when I got in the industry was not a word. Like you just, <laughs> you never heard that word. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, so it's, the industry has just gotten smarter and smarter and smarter. Uh, but, you know, again, that's something that I've had to work on, you know, so I think I've gotten a lot better at, better at that over the years at uh, trying to walk that line of, of information and entertainment. You know, someone like Matthew, for example, Matthew Berry, of course, uh, has always done a great job at that, you know, getting information out and also uh, being entertaining. And I've learned a lot from him. I've learned a lot from from Field and Stefani and, and everyone. So, uh, you know, on our team and in the industry. So, yeah, I mean. It's uh, again, depends on your platform. Uh, there's room for both now because the industry is so big, but uh, you just kind of have to pick your spot, find your lane, find what you're good at and stick to it. I love that. I love that. I love that. <clears throat> Quickly, I'll share my short Matthew Berry story because I'm sure it's like a lot of people. I started playing fantasy in 2015 on ESPN. You open it up. You see this guy, Matthew Berry. He's giving this advice. You know, 50% of the time it hits, 50% of the time it doesn't hit, just, you know, like everybody. And I remember being like, oh, this guy is such a loon. He's crazy. And, you know, just he's killing my team, blah, blah, blah. But over the years, as I've come from, and I've only played fantasy since 2015, as an early player to a content creator, watching him has been, it's really a joy. And it's honestly, I mean, I, I'm not normal. I don't usually like lavish praise on people, but he is just, I watch and when I watch him, it's just so inspiring because he does everything so well. You know, he really does nail the interpersonal and the communicative and the layman part of fantasy. He makes fantasy football conversations fun, interesting. Um, but he also is is able to give you such good information in a way that it feels like even if you've seen it before, it, it resonates with you. So hats off to him, you know, for kind of bridging that gap between the the entertaining and the communicative part of, you know, giving people education, you know, teaching people how to play fantasy, how to win, how to fun. And I will also say one of my absolute favorite moments in the whole world is his rant. Was it two years ago against when Alfred Morris did not get his extra yard or whatever? Um, just add it to the, the resume of Kyle Shanahan and running backs, just letting people, just hurting people constantly. Um, one of the best pieces of content on the whole Internet, in my opinion, that was. Um, all right. Now, before we get out of here, it's been 15 minutes. I thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up some IDP. Just a thought. Uh, I have two questions in the IDP department. Um, one is just, you know, you and I talked about this last year at Canton. But what do you think is the is the kind of the primary variable that's kind of holding people back from trying IDP fantasy football? Uh, I would love to hear what your thoughts are on why it's not just kind of a more doesn't get a little bit more attention. I have some thoughts, but I'm curious on what your thoughts are, because we know it doesn't get the attention it necessarily deserves, but kind of the why of that. Uh, yeah, so it's just intimidating. I think that it's really that simple. I mean, a lot of people know the offensive stars, or if you get into fantasy within a couple of years, you get a pretty good feel for those star players, and it's not terribly hard to follow four positions. You know, IDP is 11 positions or 11 starters, you know, uh, you know, at least 
potentially three positions if you're just looking at mm-hmm. you know linemen linebackers and dbs but now you know especially the way we have it designed at espn now we have in- interior defensive tackle or in- interior defensive linemen edge rushers off ball linebackers corners and safeties you know you could design it a lot of different ways people just don't know the players so it's not as fun right it's like um, watching a it's hard to get into a sport like another sport if you're watching you don't know the teams you don't know the players uh, it's easier to be more invested once you have a feel for them, you know them, maybe know a little personal stuff about them, whatever it may be, right? So mm-hmm. um, I think it's really that. I think that's the short and long of it, just not understanding it and not knowing the players. Excellent. Uh, that's that's honestly almost exactly what I think, too, is, you know, we are, you know, you're an educator. You know, I am uh, somewhat of an entertainer or an influencer is kind of what I would put myself as in the market. And it's I think that, it, like you said, it's just the attention. It's It needs a few more people of high level influence to kind of give people, you know, the information that they can trust. You know, even if it's not great information, if it's somebody you trust, you're going to take it and you'll still learn from it. Um, and I think, like you said, that's kind of it. It's the intimidation and it's just the not knowing. But um, I'm, do, I'm doing my part, you know, to try to bring it up a little bit more. I've noticed a lot of analysts kind of I call us mid you know middle mid-tier analysts like myself uh they're kind of pushing a little bit more into it so I'm very excited about the future of that um you know I really like I said I appreciate I don't know if you guys talk about it a lot on ESPN but again your projections you know you do the IDP stuff and it's it's an incredible resource for myself and I know other people that play IDP so we just have to say I want to say thank you very very much for that not neglecting us not um you know looking away um it, it's really you know these are helpful and it's helping me build my brand, which is hopefully going to help, you know, fantasy football, IDP, some defensive players get a little more brand equity, a little more money, you know, all that good stuff that comes with recognition. So, um, all right, my final thought, I, I have to get a little bit of a player thought in here because you're, you know, a great mind and I'm looking at your, your, your projections right now. So I saw here in your projections now, you know, specifically the Los Angeles Chargers, um, they added Kyle Van Noy this year. A uh, guy, you know, coming off the edge usually for the Patriots, for the Miami. You have him in the uh, actual the linebacker column for your projections. You have Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack in the edge. You ended up putting Kyle Van Noy into the kind of the traditional more linebacker role, 70 tackles, three and a half sacks. Do you think that that is going to stay true? Do you really think he's going to kind of play that middle linebacker role? Or do you think he's going to end up being more of that edge and maybe rotate in and out with with Bosa and Khalil Mack? Yeah, so uh, I think both, right? Uh, I think he was brought in to be a versatile weapon, right? So they have uh, a more of a need, I would say, at off-ball linebacker in terms of impact players, right? Drew Tranquil. Kenneth Murray hasn't panned out so far and is injured mm-hmm. right now. They brought in Troy Reader, who I don't think they necessarily want to be an every down player, right? So uh, work in progress at that position. I think he'll, you know, he'll be in coverage a little bit, but he, as we know, he can do it all. And that's always been a situation, right? Sometimes he leans more towards off ball linebacker. Tom, sometimes he, like in Miami, for example, sometimes he leans more towards edge, edge rusher, which he's done uh, at times in New England. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just last season, we had him charted as, uh, you know, an outside linebacker, which would, at times being edge rusher 58% of the time, he was at off ball linebacker 32% of the time, you know, he passed a uh, rush to passer 23% of the time. Otherwise he was in run defense or coverage. Right. So that's a lot more than your typical uh, off ball linebacker, but a lot less of a pass rusher than a normal edge rusher. Right. So he's just a versatile player. And here's the thing, Bosa and Mac, you know, Mac's 31 years old, but he's still a guy that can play 80% of the snaps. Right. That's exactly where I have him. This year, Joey Bosa rarely leaves the field. He'll he'll be at or around 80, uh, 85%, right? So where does that leave Van Noy in the edge rushing battle, right? You know, uh, you know, you, yeah. 10, you know, 15, 20% of the snaps, something like that. So um, that's why I kind of lean that direction. I think it'll be less of a rotation, more of Van Noy kind of in and out, on and off the field. And if he is playing 80% of the snaps, actually, you know what? I have him at 70%, right? So uh, that, that puts him at off-ball linebacker quite a bit in this offense. But again, the short and long of it is you could put him at edge rusher. You could list him at off ball linebacker. He's going to play both spots. Love it. There's a lot of equity for IDP for players like that. Look at Micah Parsons last year, played a lot of off ball linebacker, but was capable off the edge, played some snaps there too. Can rush the passer from the blitz spot in the middle as well. Kyle Van Noy, uh, last couple of years, seasons, he's been a good value. I like him a lot here. I just had to ask you that because when I saw that, I was like, ooh, that's interesting because in my head, I was kind of just putting him on the edge. But I saw you had him projected for 70 tackles, and I was like, okay, well, he thinks he's going to be playing, you know, some some of that middle spot. So had to pick your brain on that. Um, 
thank you so much, Mike, for your time, uh, for your, you know, your, your, all the kind things you said about for us, IDP. Uh, thank you for everything that you shared about, you know, your story and fantasy. Thank you for everything that you do over at ESPN. Thank you for your rankings. Um, I look forward to seeing you in Canton. I guess a week from today, we're both going to be there. That's kind of crazy. Or wait, what is it, Thursday? A week from tomorrow, we'll be there. So um, see you in Ohio, my guy. Uh, what, what do you got going on the rest of this week? Where can people find you? I mean, obviously on ESPN, but any any, any secret alpha you can drop on us? Uh, yeah, just the Fantasy Focus podcast. Uh, of course, ESPN.com. I have some content up there. But I uh, really appreciate having me on. Good to talk a little defense, and uh, I will see you in Canton. Yes, sir. All right, Mike, you have a good one, my guy. Uh, good luck for the rest of your day. And again, I appreciate your time. So uh, take it easy, man. All right, you too. Take